Hello, and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today we are going to again talk about Susie Liu. Now, I did a video a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it only feels like a couple of weeks ago here in 2020, about this specific YouTuber, primarily because a number of people asked me to talk about her. And this particular YouTuber was doing anime reaction shows and apparently causing trouble for a number of other YouTubers based on strikes and complaints and things along those lines. As I said in that video, I'm not so interested in getting involved in the various dramas here on YouTube. Frankly, I'm not the right person to ask about how to feel about those specific concerns. But I do like to hopefully help illuminate and educate folks on the concepts of intellectual property law, copyright in particular, as it relates to YouTube. As a result of this video that I did, it looks like on May 13th, so only a little over one week ago, a number of people came into my comments, a couple of other people left messages for me, talking to me about the fact that this particular YouTuber was striking people at some point in the past based on the fact that she held a copyright in her face. And they asked me my opinions on this. I said I hadn't heard the complaint. I will look at it. And I thought now would be a good time to discuss it. Now, just like that previous video, this is not intended to single out anyone in particular. I think a lot of people could get confused on these particular points. Everyone gets confused about copyright and trademark and patents and all the various intellectual property rights that the law recognizes. So I don't want to ascribe blame. I don't want to have dogpiling or piling on of anything related to this. But I do think it's useful for people to understand that no, nobody has a copyright in their face. And that plays a major role in how we need to think about the DMCA. Because as we will talk about in this video, the DMCA, the C is right there in the abbreviation, relates only to copyrights. When you're dealing with YouTube about copyright strikes, when you're issuing takedown notices, you might have a right of some kind in your face, in your name, in anything else. That doesn't make it a copyright, and that means that the law about copyrights is foreclosed to you. And I understand that's the easy way to go about handling things, is to use a DMCA takedown, but if you aren't talking about copyright, you shouldn't be using those avenues. Obviously, we've talked a lot about DMCA copyright abuse this month in May, specifically about how Sony was dealing with the Last of Us leak. So this is not unique to Suzy Liu. This is not unique to YouTubers. There are a lot of folks out there using the DMCA because it's easy and not because it's appropriate. So in looking at this issue, I found this tweet from Susie Liu about a year ago that said, I own the copyright to my face, which is what you used without permission, talking to another YouTuber who was clipping her out and making a response video. You were clearly desperate to use someone who gets views to help your video get a boost, lol, too bad. And undoubtedly, in the world of YouTube, you do talk about other things that are trending or are popular, and so she's probably right. Whatever YouTuber was commenting on these various things probably was talking about Ms. Lou because it was a popular topic in the YouTube sphere. And if we go and we look at the Reddit post that was issued in, I believe it was March of last year on this, we also get a little bit of extra description and we find out that she was copyright striking channels. Copyright striking, meaning going through Google and YouTube's procedure to what amounts to issue a DMCA takedown notice. Now, that's a problem, as we talked about at the top of this video. If we go back and we think about what copyright actually protects, we've looked at this before. This is the copyright offices in the United States' actual description of what copyright protects. This isn't legally operative. This is just their summary, but we're going to look at the statutes as well. Copyright. A form of intellectual property law protects original works of authorship, including literary, dramatic, musical, and artistic works such as poetry, novels, movies, songs, computer software, and architecture, and videos. It's interesting that videos isn't on that list. Copyright does not protect facts, ideas, systems, or methods of operation, although it may protect the way these things are expressed. Ideas versus expression being a very common refrain and discussion point here in virtual legality. But as you can tell from what I've highlighted today, the main thing that we need to focus on here is was something authored? If we think back to why copyright exists at all, why it is specifically articulated as something that Congress can put forward as a system, as a mechanism of protections in the Constitution, 
This is not statutory. It doesn't originate in the statute alone. This is actually in the United States Constitution. The notion was is that the law needed to protect creation. It needed to protect people wanting to be creative, getting those artistic works out there, writing books, making movies, doing YouTube videos. Absolutely. Susie Liu and every other YouTuber has a copyright in the YouTube creation that they make, but not every element of that creation, as we know, right? When we talk about Susie Liu or any other reaction YouTuber and whether or not they're falling under fair use, we are already acknowledging that they are using someone else's copyrighted materials. They don't own the copyright to every element of their work, but they might own the copyright if they followed fair use requirements to the entirety of the work because they're allowed to use certain other aspects of what other people own in their own creation. Copyright is designed to protect that act of creation, but you don't really have authorship when you talk about somebody's face, right? If we go and we actually look at what the copyright law specifically protects, and we haven't actually looked at section 102 in the past because it's kind of what we assume when we're talking about copyrights, it says copyright protection subsists in accordance with this title, this statute, in original works of authorship, just like we discussed, fixed in any tangible medium of expression. Now we could argue about whether a human body is a tangible medium of expression, but it doesn't really dovetail with what we think of when we think about this language. Now known or later developed from which they can be perceived, reproduced, or otherwise communicated either directly or with the aid of a machine or a device right? Computer code is still protected, even though we can't read it ourselves other than as ones and zeros. Works of authorship include the following categories, literary works, books, musical works, songs, dramatic works, movies, television, pantomimes, choreographic works, dances, funny little movements, pictorial graphic and sculptural works, motion pictures, audiovisual, sound recordings, architecture. And those are the eight things listed right? And if you are familiar with virtual reality, you know, we might point out, hey, this says it includes it. Does that mean it includes but is not limited to? Is this a broader group than just this? And so we turn to the compendium of U.S. Copyright Office Practices, chapter 300, in which we find that, no, as a matter of fact, it is limited to that list, even with the use of the word including. A work of authorship may be registered, provided that it constitutes copyrightable subject matter. Section 102A of the Copyright Act states the subject matter of copyright includes the following categories. And then Congress gave federal courts the flexibility to interpret the scope of the existing subject matter categories, but only Congress has the authority to create entirely new categories of authorship. If the federal courts do not have the authority to establish new categories of subject matter, it necessarily follows that the Copyright Office also has no such authority in the absence of any clear delegation of authority to the register of copyrights. Said another way, this is the list, folks. And can you put a face in any of this? It's not a book. It's not a song. It's not a movie. It's not a sculpture. Maybe it's close to a sculpture, but it's not a sculpture. And so when we read this kind of material from, yes, chapter 300 of this compendium, welcome to the world of federal law and regulation, folks then we see that that's the list that is all encompassing of what can be copyrighted under United States copyright law. It also follows that there are things that are specifically not copyrightable. If we look at the end of this paragraph in particular, it says, for representative examples of works that do not satisfy this requirement, go to chapter 313. And I think we will because chapter 313 makes this even more obvious, right? In 313 of this compendium, they talk about what is uncopyrightable, and that includes works that are not fixed. If you never took a tape of your speech, it's not copyrightable because it only ever existed in the ether. If you never put down exactly what the choreography was, whether it's in video or paper or wherever, it's not protected. But more importantly for us, works that lack human authorship are what aren't protected. As discussed in Section 306, the Copyright Act protects original works of authorship. To qualify as a work of authorship, a work must be created by a human being. Now, you might say, Rick, I'm pretty sure Susie Liu was created by a human being. And I think you're probably right. Almost everybody on this planet is. But that's not really the end of the story, and that's not what we're talking about. Also note that copyrights can be held by the author of the copyright-protected work. If we assume that 
authorship here is another human being, then Susie Liu or whatever YouTuber you want to talk about doesn't have the copyright in their face. Their parents do. They're the authors. You don't have authorship over your own face. I can't determine how I look. I mean, I could eat better, of course, but I don't determine directly how I look. And neither does Susie Liu, neither do you, neither does the person next to you. And in all honesty, this is angels on the head of a pin because this isn't what the Copyright Act is aimed at anyway. For in the next paragraph, we see the office will not register works produced by nature, animals, or plants. Likewise, the office cannot register a work purportedly created by divine or supernatural beings, right? That's your other option. Susie Liu or whomever was created by God. And the Copyright Office says, great, we can't give God a copyright, and so we're not gonna. Although the office may register a work where the application of the deposit copy state that the work was inspired by a divine spirit. You could say, I'm the author, but I was inspired by God. You can actually put that in your registration. The Copyright Office says, okay, Fine. We're not going to do anything extra with that piece of information, but we appreciate it. And the examples they give are, we're not going to copyright a photograph taken by a monkey or a mural painted by an elephant. That all makes sense. But the third bullet is where we really need to focus. A claim based on the appearance of actual animal skin, right? So we're starting to see exactly how this kind of flows to human likenesses, right? This is all focused on animals because the Copyright Office is focused on animals. But you see here in the first sentence, it's nature, animals, and plants. So while I don't want to get into a whole scientific didactic here, the very same philosophy that states that you can't just have these kinds of things that appear in nature copyrighted will prohibit the copywriting of a human likeness, right? And I think we all intuitively know that you can't have a copyright in your face. Now, you can trademark your face, and maybe that's what Susie Liu or maybe some other YouTubers are thinking of. You can associate your likeness or various aspects of your likeness with a trademark, with your ability to sell things. Now, if you aren't familiar with it, trademarks are different from copyrights. Copyrights are the copy of anything specific. It is the actual language used in a book. It are the actual song and the lyrics and the music as it is composed together. The actual video that you put up on YouTube. A trademark is a name or a symbol or maybe trade dress, a set of colors and logos that tell the world that this thing comes from you or it comes from your company. So you can trademark the name Susie Lou, maybe, if you can get it through the trademark office. Maybe you can trademark your na- your face if you put it on a stamp or in a very specific logo. And, and maybe that's what she's trying to get at here. But it's not copyright. It's also not the same thing as publicity rights, right? She might also be thinking, hey, I know there are certain laws out there and I don't know where she lives. I don't know her jurisdiction, but I know there are certain laws out there that say you can't use my face in certain ways. And so one of the things that I did while I was looking at stuff for this video to talk with you all about was to go look at the jurisdiction in the United States that is by far the most protective of these likeness and publicity rights. And so I pulled up the California Code Here we've got section 3344. This is the California statute that protects their actors and their actresses and their sports figures and all the other glitz and glamour of Hollywood. And we see here exactly how it operates. It says any person who knowingly uses another's name, voice, signature, photograph, or likeness in any manner. So you do anything with it. You use a straight up photo, you make a stamp out of it, you put it on your own logo, you could be in trouble. Or... On or in products, merchandise, or goods, or for the purpose of advertising or selling or soliciting purchases of products, merchandise, goods, or services, shall be liable for any damages sustained by the person whose identity you stole. So we see here that this is actually a lot narrower than copyright. Copyright says, hey, if you've got a copyright in something, you control completely what somebody else can do with it. You license it out, you tell them what they can do with it, and with the exception of primarily fair use, you have complete exclusive control over how it appears in the world. Even in California, it doesn't go that far with respect to publicity and likeness rights. It says, nobody can steal it from you for the purpose of selling something. You can't take Susie Lou's face Put it on your brand new ketchup recipe, slap it on the bottle and call it Susie Lou's ketchup and sell it at Walmart or wherever. You can't do that under California law. I can't speak to every jurisdiction. As you can tell from this being in a statute, it's going to be different in every state. But 
You can't just take someone else's likeness, put it on something that you want to sell that suggests that they endorse it. It's very similar to the concept of trademark infringement. You can't just take somebody else's stuff and pretend like they are saying, this is a good thing that you should buy if you didn't get that consent. If you signed a contract with them, you're all good. Now you might say, hey, but aren't these people that are commenting on her selling ads on YouTube and things along those lines? Yes. And in California, that's not really an issue. The use of a name, voice, signature, photograph, or likeness in a commercial medium shall not constitute a use for which consent is required under that first section solely because the material containing such use is commercially sponsored or contains paid advertising. Rather, it shall be a question of fact, something for a jury to determine, whether or not the use of the person's name, voice, signature, photograph, or likeness was so directly connected with the sponsorship or paid advertising as to constitute a use that would be a violation of the section we just read. And then because California understands that there's a First Amendment right to freedom of speech in the United States in general, and that's above California statutory code, they try to give an out for that as well. For purposes of this section, a use of a name, voice, signature, photograph, or likeness in connection with news, public affairs, sports broadcasts, or political campaign won't be a problem either. And probably the First Amendment protects a few more things than that. But suffice it to say, if you're making a commentary on a news item, you don't even get into the likeness kind of concept in California, which is by far one of the most protective. And this isn't copyright. When you talk about publicity and likeness rights, it isn't copyright. I've pulled up the Digital Media Law Project website on this concept specifically with respect to California, where they articulate that a right of publicity claim fails if it is too similar to a copyright claim. In such a case, the state right of publicity law is preempted by federal copyright law. And we actually see that at the tail end of this case. The court finds that the subject matter of the state law claims in California fall within the subject matter specified by the Copyright Act. The rights are equivalent to those found in the Copyright Act. Accordingly, plaintiff's state law claims are preempted. And this was about someone trying to use uh, song lyrics or, or song recordings in a way that the actual singer didn't like. It was a sampling case. But suffice it to say, when we talk about all these things, this isn't copyright. Publicity, likeness, Susie Lou might be right. She might have an issue with certain of the way the YouTubers are using her face, but it isn't copyright. And ultimately, when we get down to what a strike is, I've pulled up now the DMCA, our very favorite 17 USC 512. You have to be able to make a claim that something was infringed under copyright. Identify the copyrighted work claimed to have been infringed. State that you have a good faith belief that use of the material in the manner complained of is not authorized by the copyright owner. And a statement that the information in the notification is accurate and under penalty of perjury that the complaining party is authorized to act on behalf of the owner of an exclusive right allegedly infringed. And we've looked at it before, but Google and their copyright infringement notification requirements exactly mirror that kind of concept which is all a long way of saying, and I don't want to just specifically label Susie Liu as problematic on this particular question because I think a lot of people could get stuck in this same kind of thought process. Your face, what you put on a YouTube video, is not necessarily something that you can protect in isolation. You have a copyright in the entire video, but people can clip it out. They can use it for fair use. That's entirely what fair use is designed to do. And if you could just block people with a copyright strike for using any single element of your video, we'd have major, major problems across the entirety of copyright law. So the fact that this apparently did happen, that YouTube didn't do anything about it for at least a period of time, about a year ago, that they are continuing to have abuse issues as we saw over this past month with respect to Sony and its claims, means that yes, as we have come to the conclusion of in respect of past virtual legality videos, the DMCA on the whole and the incentives that are given to these various platform providers like YouTube or Twitch or Steam or anywhere else that actually allows user content to be uploaded and to be made available to the world, they need to be rethought because these companies are far too easily allowing any strike and making it very difficult for counter notifications to be given the power that they need to have. So yes, I think something like that is probably abusive. Certainly if somebody is sophisticated and knows all these issues with respect to intellectual property, if it's not abusive, it is at least misunderstanding the nature of what copyright law is designed to protect. 
This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, tell people we are here. We are talking about these kinds of things all the time. A incredibly popular video that we put up yesterday, much to my surprise, called No Ubisoft Won't Own Your Soul, but they could certainly have said that more clearly, is what we did most recently talking about terms of service and how it's easy to misconstrue what is in those things while you still want to be very sensitive to what corporations are trying to take from you or tell you that they can do to you, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to panic about it. And we've obviously talked a lot about The Last of Us leaks and various other aspects of business and law all through the lens of pop culture. If you saw this on on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it in its podcast form, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. 